Welcome to Digital Asset News. My name is Rob, and today, instead of doing a live stream, I needed to break it down, uh, what's going on with the Fed and if they're going to pivot. And there was this great interview, and it was with uh, Mary Daly, and she is the president of the uh, San Francisco Federal Reserve. And she asked, and was asked and answered a lot of good questions. And one of those was, uh, will you pivot and when will you stop? The next one was, when is restrictions enough? And what's the Fed's overall plan? Next one was, how long could you be raising rates? And this is the one that is, I think is most important. So uh, if you think it's going to happen or stop anytime soon, I think you're wrong. And also, how do you know when you've gone too far? And this is one of their biggest criticisms, forward versus lagging indicators. And lastly, we're going to talk about, uh, the question was, what about the global economy and the UN calling for you to stop and the Bank of England and other Federal Reserves across the, across the country, across the world, uh, which are starting to pivot? Why don't you guys and will you pivot? So the first question is very simple. Mary Daly was asked, uh, will you pivot and when will you stop? And this is important to understand because right now a lot of people are calling for the Fed to pivot and they believe that they will pivot. I don't know if that is true, and I was going to have you listen to uh, this snippet. It's about a minute long, and I'll be right back. We are resolute at raising the interest rate into restrictive territory so that we can bring inflation down, which is causing millions of Americans to suffer real pain, and everyone's experiencing it. It's also very damaging to the economy to have this level of inflation, so we're committed to bringing it down and staying the course until we're well and truly done. So yeah, Mary laid it out pretty eloquently there, is they are not going to pivot uh, anytime soon. So it made a lot of sense to me. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. But the next question is, I think what's on everybody's mind is, is what is restrictive enough? How far are they going to go? And what's the Fed's overall plan? So I'm going to let Mary just uh, describe to you exactly what's going on here. Well, when uh, we were speaking before the interview, you said that the futures market hump shape, the idea that you go up and then you come back down next year is wrong. Yeah, I don't see that happening at all. I see us as raising to a level that we believe is restrictive enough to bring inflation down and then holding it there until we see inflation truly get close to 2% and, and demonstrate that price stability is restored. So pretty much what she just said there was, look, uh, we know that there's some problems coming up and uh, we know that uh, there's some issues. But if you're thinking like a lot of different uh, market makers and people who are taking a look at this analyst and saying, well, it's just going to be a big hump. It's going to go up and it's going to go back down. And that's it. Uh, Mary here is saying, no, uh, throughout next year, we will probably continue to raise rates until we see it at our goal level, which is 2%. So that would answer your question uh, as to like, is this going to happen or uh, taper off anytime soon? Now, the next question that, that she was asked was, look, how do you guys do this? Because it seems to me like you're looking at a lot of uh, rear facing uh, data that is not forward looking. And are you guys just going forward until something breaks and going, okay, put the brakes on. And uh, it's a pretty thoughtful out answer here. So just take a listen. So we definitely don't raise rates until something breaks. We actually are forward looking, very forward looking. You have to be. And that's one of the things about data dependence. You can look at the data that's published. Those are tend to be backward looking. But a lot of the time I spend in my job is actually out talking to business leaders, community members, small businesses, workers, and asking, where are we in the economy? You put that together and you're constantly calibrating through this data dependence two risks, not doing enough and having inflation expectations drift because inflation just won't die off or doing too much, over oversteering essentially and causing unnecessary downturn that isn't relevant for the economy and the conditions we're trying to achieve. So we're constantly monitoring both of those risks. And I guess the main thing I want your listeners to know is it's not a backward looking enterprise, it's a forward looking enterprise. We don't want to wait till we found we got there and then say, uh oh, we want to get there uh, as smoothly as possible. This is the tool we have and it is a blunt tool. And that's why we're so careful about how we're thoughtful about the data. We are constantly out talking to people, looking at the information we have. It's not just about looking at a model and making a rule. It's really, that's, you know, the regional reserve banks, the, there's 12 of us. We spend a good portion of our time talking to leaders, business leaders, community leaders, workers, groups, to try to find out what the economy is. And, and here's what I'm hearing to a person. That when you're out there talking in the, you know, it's just in Boise, Idaho, people right now are worried about inflation. 
and they want inflation to come down. They recognize that's a major pillar of a well-functioning economy. And one young man said to me, I have plenty of jobs, but I only have 24 hours in a day and seven days of the week. And every time I work, I lose money because I go to the store and I can't afford anything. So really the main message here is inflation is problematic and we are committed to restoring price stability. So whether you agree if that's the right approach or not, it seems like the Fed is resolute and they have a vision as to where they want to go. And the last thing really comes down to this is the question, which is what about the global economy? Uh, because as we do this and, and the dollar increases in, in strength, it starts to, to crash everything around it. So what about the global economy? Doesn't America have a responsibility? And uh, we've seen uh, the Bank of England pivot as they start to do quantitative easing. Uh, we've seen the UN call for America to stop. So the question is, what does this mean for the Fed and will they start to pivot just because of the global economy? So just take a listen. We, we really have a domestic charter. That's what Congress gave us. And so we have to stay on our case. The other thing I know is that when the US is, it is a reserve currency of the world and there are many things going on besides global tightening. We have the war in Ukraine, China continues to struggle through COVID. So there's slowing across the globe and that often brings people into U.S. currency. So those are just things that happen as a natural part of the economy and the dynamics there. But the Fed stays resolute to its mission, the mission that Congress gave us, price stability, full employment. We're obviously achieving on the full employment side. We're missing on the price stability side. We have to bring inflation down. And basically that's it. We understand there's a global economy. We understand what's going on as far as the Federal Reserve does. But they're like, look, we have a mandate and we're going to hit that mandate. Uh, and that is our goal here. And that's pretty much it. So let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And then just to follow up, um, there was a question that uh, came about. It's like, well, what about, would this lead us into a, a recession? And uh, I think we're already kind of there. I think we're already there, period. And I, I know that there's, there's been some, some different definitions. But again, if we take a look at, at recessions, recessions don't last forever. I mean, this is back in 1969. Usually they're about 18, 18 to 24 months. But after those time frames, what do we see? We see big, huge economic growth. And we've had quite the run since 2009. I mean, 13 plus years take, take away coronavirus. And for me, if what Mary was talking about is like, we're going to keep continuing into 2023 and then maybe even 2024 to actually get out of it. That's another two years. That's another two years. And for me, I don't really, I see it as the same thing as we talked about before, as far as the, uh, the four year cycles. I mean, if we go from 2012, 2015, having all time high dip resets, having all time high dip reset from 2016, 2019, 2020 to 2023, if we're going to, to a recession in 2023 and 2024, and then we're kind of getting out of it in 2025, what does that mean? Economic boom, just like we saw over here. Does that mean it's going to definitely happen? I can't say that for sure because uh, all models work until they don't. And he, that's what leads me to my last point, which is this is, of course, <laughs> Mr. Wonderful Kevin O'Leary. And he's just going to give his, his opinion about where the Fed is going. And also, don't forget, uh, Kevin's got his fingers on the pulse of business, and he sees a lot of data points about what's going on. So just take a listen if you think that the, what he thinks as far as uh, recessionary woes and if the Fed's going to pivot. Look, look at it this way. 75 basis points is coming. It's built into the market already. Uh, so far, it's had no effect on inflation, still north of 8%. So why would the Fed stop? I think people that think the Fed's going to pause are, are dreaming. And so as investors, you have to make a decision. You can't time the market. You know with certainty that there are days when you make two and a half, three percent gains. You just don't know which ones. And at some point, and I don't know when it is, maybe it's Q1, you're going to get a signal from Powell that he's going to slow down. And on that day, if you're not in the market, you'll yep. lose 30 percent of the gains of what's going to happen. So I have no choice but to I, I can't control the Fed. No one can control the Fed. I'll tell you one thing that's not disturbing me that is really perplexing me. I have data every week on top line revenue and cash flows of private companies, over 50 of them. We are supposedly slowing down. We're supposedly in a recession. But you don't see it. Nowhere. Nowhere do I see it. Right. So there's this very weird irony, which is that all these CEOs say, actually, I don't feel it right now, but I think it's coming later. And that's where you are. Well, the Fed is in, in its dialogue telling me to reduce my CapEx, telling me to reduce my inventories, telling me to stop hiring people. And by the way, that seems to be working. <laughs> well, yeah, except I don't see it. I should see it. I get weekly revenue. I get weekly cash flow. 
We've had the best quarter ever, 17.5% pre-tax cash flow, when before the pandemic it was 15. The economy is still working. So, you know, it can take another 75 basis points. So there you go. That's from Kevin himself. Look, his business looks to be doing pretty good. I think other businesses might be doing pretty good. I think some are also lagging. And I think for people like uh, you and me, just uh, the basic retail investor, we may be feeling it at the pump, at the grocery store and things like that as we see inflation, which I think is why inflation should come down. Now, let me know what you think about that in the comment section, but here's what it is. And Kevin said it perfectly. Two things. First of all, you can't control it. You can't control the Fed. So just worry about the things that you can actually can control. And what he talked about was those 10 days or those days to be in the market. There was a great uh, piece over on CNBC and it goes, it talks about if you get out of the market for, and you miss the 10 best days, how much you go down. This is a chart shows how $10,000 invested in the S&P 500 for the 20 year period between 1999 and 2018 would have performed under various scenarios. If you fully invested, didn't touch it for 20 years, uh, you'd, be, you'd go from 10,000 to 30,000, which is not bad for doing nothing, but average annual return, even in the dark days, you would still be up 5.6% annualized. That's year over year. If you miss the 10 best days, it drops by more than half, 2%. If you miss the 20 days, you're down. You miss the best 30 days, you're down 2.4. Miss the best 40 days, you're down 4. And so on and so forth. So for me, you might take a look at it, time in the market, is a little bit more important than timing the market. We try to time it a little bit, but uh, usually we're never going to hit the tops or the bottoms. And that will lead me to my very last point, which is, you know, what I'm doing. I'm sticking around. I'm staying in. And this is what I'm doing. This is from my Coinbase account. And I buy crypto every day. Do I buy the same amount that I would when we're on, a, you know, we're, we're, when we're on an uptrend and there's not uh, Fed tightening and there's not uh, fantastic inflation going around and there's uh, some more stronger fundamentals. No, I am dollar cost averaging, but what I call micro DCAing, which is I'm still buying, but not as much as I did before. And Bitcoin, Ethereum, they're my blue chips and I buy them every single day, but it's less than what I usually would buy because I'm just waiting and I'm seeing. I don't want to be totally out of the market, but I'm not going to go all in. And there are some alts down here that I buy sometimes every day, sometimes every week and I'll do those in a separate video. But that is it for today. Now look, I know I went a little bit long, but I wanted to make it crystal clear about where the Fed's mission is, where they see things and what's happening. There's things that we'd like to see. I just don't know if we're actually going to see them. Again, you can't fight the Fed and you wanna control the things that are right in front of you that you can control. And that's it. So look, thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. If you liked today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and that's all. So I appreciate you stopping by and I'll see you on the next one.